Hello everyone. Hope everyone's back from break. So what we're gonna do now is uh, I was hoping to have, I, so I apologize in advance, I had intended to try to reach out to a few people who'd kind of lead the discussion, but um, I think we have enough people here and we have people who I know have been working in CWL for a while. I think we can still have a, a good discussion. Uh, but what I'd, I'm hoping is to uh, try to get some, uh, for me to not talk too much, but to try to get some of the users, you, you as users of C2EL to ex, uh, talk a little bit about your experiences and what some of your um, processes are that you use for writing code, um, things like that. Uh, I guess um, I want to open this up, but uh, I'm wondering if, if, if Michael and Suresh should be willing to kind of um, help uh, be kind of the, you know, the user representatives to um, help um, make this discussion work. Yeah, sure. Sounds good to be Michael. Do you want to start in terms of how you are using or writing CWL? Um, yeah, well, why not? Uh, so basically, I kind of both develop CWL files and also uh, work on the CWL airflow that is used to run them. Uh, so we have we use them for data analysis in our lab. I actually work at Children's Hospital, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, uh, at uh, the laboratory that does uh, epigenetics data analysis. So most of our data is um, sequencing data. And uh, we develop uh, different pipelines for RNA-seq, chip-seq, uh, single cell data analysis. Um, What else can I say? Well, the good thing is that the learning curve curve is very uh, is is not steep at all. So it was very easy to learn CWL. Uh, I would say the biggest problem was when you when I tried to make uh, some extra logic in the workflow, which is not supposed to be there. Let's say before we had a convention. Uh, conditional execution of steps in the standard. I had to kind of use some improvisation how to uh, exclude step from execution, but that the good thing that now we have this conditional execution. Um, well, most of our pipelines are run on a single node. We have our own server. Uh, Recently, I also run them on cluster with Singularity, and so far there is no any big problems. Mm. What else can I say? I mean, if, if there are any questions, then we can kind of try to discuss those questions. Michael, I might ask something, because mm -hmm. this is something we kind of uh, struggle with as well, is the versioning of the workflow. Mm -hmm. And how do you tackle that in your group? So first for each update in the, let's say I wrote some R script, I put it in the Docker file and mm -hmm. we keep versions for the Docker file. So any update in that script will create a new version of the Docker file uh, that should be used. Uh, for, for that, I need to update the requirements in my CWL file. And mm -hmm. if the tool, command line tool, uh, CWL command line tool was changed, and we have several criteria that defines was it a critical change or not critical, then we trigger version update for the workflow that used that tool. Mm -hmm. And for the critical changes are uh, added or removed inputs, updated base command, 
updated uh, Docker file version, uh, added or removed steps, and we are trying to extend them based on some empirical knowledge. So let's say we added something and then we see, oh, this should trigger the new version for the workflow in our system, but it didn't. So we add that criteria as something that the next after when we next time do the same action, it will trigger the version update. And in our system, it's also important because we try to combine different workflows together, uh, mm -hmm. not within the same CWL file, but uh, kind of upstream data analysis, let's say to generate genome indices. And then the next step to use those genome indices for ChIP-seq uh, workflow or RNA-seq work workflow. So for us, it's also important that the version of the, uh, let's say the tool that creates indices uses the same version of, of STAR. It's a program to, to map uh, row sequences. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's like the, the version of the, of the STAR in the, in the workflow that creates indices should be exactly the same as the version of the star that uses those indices to map data because we we had that problem when we updated something and then we couldn't use those indices so that's why we kind of tried to to check all of the connections between all of the tools that we use in the workflows and also between the workflows and then we uh update the version for all of those workflows together and based on that uh, on that information we can kind of see uh, if it's still uh, compatible or not so if i gather this correctly you would still be able to run the previous version of the workflow in case you uh, want to introduce an analysis or that would yes. be possible after you would be yeah. so it, it, it depends from, 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 from which side you, you look at it, at it. So let's say a user created a project. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay, so just side note. So I, I'm explaining how it works in the platform, data analysis platform that we use in our lab. It's yeah. not something that is in CWL standard, so it's managed outside of the CWL. Yeah, that's uh, what we are doing too. And yeah. we keep the versions uh, we basically keep everything in the database, in our database, so we can track whether the new version of the same workflow is available and then user can decide whether he wants to upgrade to the latest version and then he will need to rerun a lot of the samples or he can still use the old version. Mm -hmm. uh, but the criteria how we define if the workflow is updated or not and if it's a major or minor change, uh, that's what we decide I would say empirically based on the experience after errors, when something yeah. doesn't work, we say, mm -hmm. okay, that probably was a critical change. Yeah. So just on Michael's um, experiences, we also work with the clinical data. So I'm working in a cancer research lab. We get lots of whole genome data, transcriptome, panel, different kinds of data. And uh, we are working with the Lumina in a partnership to write CWL workflows that's going to process that data on their platform, which is called the Lumina Connected Analytics. And so the orchestrator majorly is ICA. Uh, we are basically writing the workflows. If it's not using Dragon, which is run on FPGA, we test it locally and make sure it works or in, on uh, EC2 instance. If it's using their specific resources, then of course we would be testing it over there. Uh, the thing we kind of noted in, from CWL side was schemas was a really useful concept to define inputs and co, but that wasn't really, it, it is in the documentation, but not in much detail. That's what I noted. Maybe I haven't missed much. You know, you can correct me if that's the case. So the way we learned about it was through different examples and workflows that are available and the tests too. So that's what we used and it's kind of very really useful just from the CWL writing perspective, I thought I would highlight it because we found it really useful. Um, otherwise, yes, that's the way we are. In terms of updates, uh, we tend to divide between production, what's being used in a production level data analysis versus what is being developed. So if I'm a developer, I'm continuously testing new features. 
So these are all changes in the development environment and we kind of separate that from the production. So we only update the production workflows once we are happy with the development outputs and code. So that's how at UMCCR we are working with CWL. Um, I have been using it for quite a while, so I wouldn't say I have problems or you know a steep learning curve. If I see a new feature, I kind of pick it up. But we tend to um, educate and train more people in CWL too who are more, for example, using Nextflow. So they, they, that's the learning curve, which is harder to get over. So they find it that, okay, that's hard to read now. I can't understand why you are writing in this way and co. Uh, but I think there are benefits and then you have for those benefits, there are some points too, you have to work over those. So yeah, that's from our side. For me, I also use CWL not even within the system, but let's say I need to run something to, to test some new mm. tool. Sometimes yeah. it's easier just to write a simple CWL file and then even put some bash script inside that mm. uh, CWL format, because then I can create a, a JSON job file. And then let's say I did some part of my work, then I got distracted to work with another project then I came back to, mm. to this to the same project I see what were my inputs I don't need to look through the history of all of my bash commands, bash commands so yeah. that's uh, one of the convenient points from using CWL yeah from the research side too if we work on something yeah that's a useful way to document it uh, for other people's too and just to be talking to managers and tell them where the progress is sitting yeah it's easier if you have a CWL tool that works already so are you two using CWL2? What is the implementation that you guys are using? If I run it locally, I use CWL2. If uh, we need to process some huge amounts of data and we need to run it on our server, we we'll use CWL Airflow for that. The same for us too. Locally, we use CWL tool. And when we are using or uh, running on ICA platform, they are using a modified version, I believe, of Airflow too. Of Airflow? Ah, okay. So you are speaking about that's Illumina. Illumina, yeah, uh, that's their platform, Pratik and team. Yes, that's right. Uh, as far as I remember, they were planning, we actually were speaking with them once mm -hmm. about how to make CWL Airflow work on Kubernetes. I don't know mm -hmm. if they're still uh, using Airflow for that because the last uh, the last time I, I spoke with I think Pratik, he mentioned that they decided to to move to some other direction from Airflow because it was too difficult to configure it to work with Kubernetes. But who knows? Maybe it still works with with. Uh, they are planning to release a newer version of their platform. They call it V2 now. And the last time I spoke, I knew they were using Airflow. I can check again and confirm they're still on it, but we haven't heard that they have changed in terms of the back end what they are using. It's going to be a bigger, bigger change, right? That means work. Uh, not that for we users. Are like... it, it depends it on mm -hmm. how compatible the features are on the new platform, because we kind of worked with them to make sure all the features we were using from CWL works on their execution engine. If you change the backend altogether to a newer platform, then we have to retest and make sure the workflows work there too, right? That's why we all use CWL, which is portable interoperable. I don't even know how to pronounce it, but portability, interoperability, uh, and so on and so on. So in theory, it shouldn't influence on anything uh, from that uh, from from the users who develop the workflow. It should be exactly the same. But from the testing, at least we have to test it for them to make sure the workflows are working the way we expect it to be. On V2, we are testing, but I need to check if they have changed the platform. I'm not aware if they are moving away from Airflow. Uh, that's check. what they mentioned. I don't know. It's not open source, so. No, know. it's not open it's... source. That's right. We kind of discussed with them. One thing was we wanted them to include CWL as one of the they were, I wanted, we wanted them to have their name in the CWL website as a supporter for the language. I think that would be nice. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few, I don't know, they're working through with their management and co. That's their job anyway, but we kind of highlighted that. That's kind of missing. Uh, and the other bit is uh, making 
sure that the changes are at least transferred back to the master branch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the project. I'd just like to uh, give everyone else a chance. If anyone, um, Amanda, B, Helen, Manabu, Nicholas, uh, and you know Tomoyo, anyone else wants to talk about what they're doing? Tomoyo, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, Peter. We kind of made it a one-to-one. -one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so, oh, hi, my, I'm Manabu, and uh, we always using a uh, uh, cluster system at uh, some institute, and uh, so we want to try the uh, using the AWS toy uh, for you to use AWS, but uh, we never try that. So this year. Uh, my personal purpose is uh, testing uh, a lot of implementation against to the AWS cloud. So maybe next year I want to present it about that. <laughs> but uh, sorry, I don't have any information about the how, uh, which runner is running on the cloud. Uh, so I just try the very uh, in institute have a huge cluster and uh, I only uh, using Toil on that, but uh, Toil works very well. Uh, thanks. Once and uh, before that, uh, I created the own cluster at the uh, Azure, and uh, I throw the job, but uh, it's not AWS. But I created the Slam cluster, and uh, so uh, yeah, that, that's all. <laughs> I have a couple of silly questions. Like, what's what uh, is your favorite text editor to use for editing C to Bail? I use uh, uh, VS Code, and uh, uh, there is a syntax highlighter. And sometimes I use a Beam. Uh, at the, but uh, uh, favorite editor is uh, uh, VS Code, and uh, using the Tomoya created some good tools for writing the CWL at the VS Code. And uh, I really love that. <laughs> I'm also using VS Code yet. Another fan here. Sorry, did someone ask? Me or in, in general? That was because... just a, I. That was for that was for everyone. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. I I, I got just distracted. <laughs> I because I'm distracted again. Uh, the VS Code plugin. Do you use the the Benton plugin or a different one? Uh, I'm sorry. I just have. My headphones connected to the wrong. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, my headphones just got connected to the iPad, so it was. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, good. So yeah, I I mainly use VS Code um, for everything basically for CWL for Python. For R, just convenient way. I'm sorry, I got distracted because I have iPad that is streaming, live stream from. Uh, well, you all know about the war between Ukraine and Europe. Oh, and I'm sorry, not Europe, Russia. And there is currently a battle on the biggest, not the big battle, but some kind of battle near the biggest uh, nuclear plant in Europe. So I just was a little bit distracted by that event. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. that. No, it's OK. We all are affected by this news, so yeah. Uh, sorry? 
No, we, I was saying it's okay. I think somehow we all are affected by the news. It's war. It's, it affects everyone. Doesn't matter where you are. Yeah, for me, uh, for me, it affects even more because I'm from Ukraine. <laughs> so that's why I. I, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, of course. It's, it's on a different level to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Uh, anyway, yeah, it was like a side topic. Yeah, I mostly use VS Code for 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 everything. It's kind of convenient. I don't know if. I try to use different plugins to highlight CWL syntax. It is convenient, but sometimes it feels like, I would say it's like, you know, some people like to use even Veeam in the command line to, 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 to code something. So sometimes I feel the same. I want as simple as possible. So I'm not really using different plugins for syntax highlight. Maximum maybe just uh, YAML or uh, kind of the, the syntax highlight for the YAML uh, format, not something specific for CWL. Yeah, same. I don't know if something you, anyone would recommend anything. I'm not using any plugin in VS Code. Uh, can I say something? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah um, I guess the uh, Rabbit's Venten is the language server, so uh, you can use the uh, uh, Rangi server plugin for Beam or Emacs or some other editors. I guess Rabbit Vente can use, uh, yeah, you, you can use uh, Vente in other editors, I guess. But sorry, I, I, I haven't tried it yet for others. I think I'm the only one that is not using VS Code. I'm on PyCharm. So I'm normally looking at Python code or JavaScript code, and I open YML and CWL as YML as well. I, I mean, personally, I do uh, recommend uh, VS Code for beginners because um, it's the Benton plugin is it's the easiest to set up and it's gives you the syntax highlighting and the code completion. Uh, although yeah, I was going to ask about use... code completion. <laughs> it, yeah, it will do code completion of things like file names and, and keywords. So that's, I think that's actually very helpful. Um, unfortunately, uh, it hasn't been developed in a year because the person who developed it left Seven Bridges and Seven Bridges hasn't quite figured out what they're doing yet. But are, Peter, are you are talking the, about the Rebix? In the, the specific, the Benton language server, which has a VS, yeah. which is the VS Code plugin. So that provides the syntax highlighting, the um, code completion. It has a visualization as well that's built into VS Code. Mm -hmm. It's it's really neat. I definitely recommend it. But are we able to release a new version of Painting ourselves if we want, or does it depend on Seven Bridges hiring another person and releasing themselves? Right, that's the problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so it's not community managed. Manage right, that's a, yeah, that's a that's a conversation we're having with them. Hmm. It might, it, I, the, I suppose the worst case scenario is it could be forked and renamed. And so then it would do, be, I don't know, Benton. Do you know if it works with, with version 1.2? Yes, I believe so. It actually, it automatically installs a version of CWL tool that has been compiled into a standalone not quite standalone, but into into a uses something called PyInstaller. It creates a standalone Python installation that's able to run it. Yeah, I use that for to bring Python to supercomputer, the Python installer. Uh, yeah, and I'm also looking at the tools that are shared in the channel now. I think they were shared yesterday as well in the Japanese community um, panel. The only one that I'm not seeing here yet that I remember is Sapporo. That was interesting because from what I understood, you can use that as a layer to submit the workflows to different implementations like 
you could have a Nexi flow workflow that you submit to Sapporo and Sapporo knows how to run, or you could have CWL when you submit as well, which I think is one of the problems that you have, right, Sirish, that you have researchers that you still want to use next next flow. Uh, that's right. Just because I think next flow is a bit easier in terms of writing it. That's what they say. Um, I have looked at it. Yes, it's, it follows a Python kind of a structure. Yeah, that's what their opinion is. Also, I think the next flow tower is um, kind of really appreciated among the research community, that project. Yeah, in my previous job, we used uh, Snake Make a lot and also Next Flow, and there was very little CWL. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody raising their hand or just? <laughs> reacting I thought it was a reaction <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure who did it well I have, a, I have another <clears throat> oh Manabu Manabu yeah uh, hi I'm Manabu and uh, I use the uh, Sapro to throw the job and uh, so I uh, currently I using uh, Sapporo and uh, to Sapporo from Sapporo and uh, using and uh, using the toy and uh, throw CWL job to the SRAM clusters and uh, it's uh, very uh, easy to the uh, for beginner just uh, so some clusters. Uh, Related setting is a uh, difficult thing for the researchers, and uh, but uh, Sapporo uh, wrap it and uh, as a, uh, so my administrator like me and uh, just uh, set up for good uh, uh, setting for the SRAM and uh, I and uh, provided the Sapporo interface to the uh, researchers. The researcher can easily throw job, and uh, from the browser, and uh, so there are very few uh, no knowledge about the cluster system. Just uh, they only writing the uh, CWL job job file job configuration, and uh, just throw it. And uh, and Sapro has a uh, uh, so a lot of features. So. That uh, it's hard to <laughs> uh, describe everything in very few minutes, and uh, so, but a uh, very good interface and uh, starts a good point and uh, uh, really good connection to the uh, 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 toy and other things. And uh, one more things, uh, 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 Sapro supports the another other <laughs> workflow learners like uh, uh, next flow snake make everything, and but. Uh, Researcher only writes the configuration file for that. So, uh, very interesting project and very helpful for my work. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's what I liked about Sapporo um, because um, my current job doesn't have much to do with research or CWL, but the previous one in the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research in New Zealand, the researchers had to log in to the supercomputer and learn how to submit NextFlow, SnakeMake, um, sometimes WL or just PBS, uh, KeySub. And they didn't like to learn these tools. They didn't like to learn, learn even the workflow languages. So I thought about having a tool like this would be interesting, especially if they are now using Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Notebooks. If there was an integration in the future between Jupyter Notebooks and Sapporo, that would be very interesting as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, it very good, and uh, so uh, just uh, feedback to the Sapporo developer team, <laughs> also, uh, including me. So, uh, um, yeah, very good suggestion. Thanks. Just on another, a different topic. Maybe Peter can 
help educate me on that or keep keep me updated you know where are we with the cwls and development i kind of worked on it end of last year then i was on mac leave came back obviously work has got on to me so where are we what are the next steps um is it still happening i'm sorry <clears throat> the development of of what exactly the cwls and development oh um there yeah the actually michael and a uh, team has been working on the actually there's a talk there was a talk about it on the in the first session uh i don't mm -hmm. think we're doing it today but yeah we we don't have it we're not we're not replaying it right now but um <clears throat> and on on but uh, yeah, I can find that it's about the lesson development that's happening, that's been happening. So they're actually mm -hmm. have been putting together the beginner lessons, workflow thinking, uh, sort of software carpentry style. I think it's, yeah. uh, there's a, there's a beginning lesson, an intermediate lesson. And, uh, those are, will be sort of tr piloted pretty soon in the next couple of months they're going to start using them to teach actual classes and so i mm -hmm. think this is being done done by some people from uh elixir the europe european uh bioinformatics um whatever elixir is exactly <laughs> <laughs> multi-country collaboration I kind of contributed to one of the lessons. I think that was merged, but then there were changes requested um, from someone from Curie, I believe. Uh, I forgot her name. Um, oh, Sarah? She was also involved. Yes, yeah, Sarah. She That's was, Sarah. yeah, she was working on that a bit. Um, but yeah. yeah, that was some, that was a, a while ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now that, yeah, now Michael has had uh, been working with some other people. Yeah, per, better better beginner material is something that we really have been mm. trying to trying to trying to focus on, and um, I think also the user guide needs a big needs a lot of attention because there's a lot of features that are not well documented that are that exist but are hard to find. Yeah, like schema definition. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right. Mm. I had one other discussion point. Uh, what do, if you are um, developing a new workflow and you don't want to write all of the tool wrappers, where do you go to find tool wrappers or fragments of workflows or things? Where, where do you copy and paste your code from? I can answer. <laughs> so usually I first go to GitHub and uh, I know on the Common Workflow Language website, there is a shortcut how to put that uh, search string on GitHub so you can uh, search only among the CWL files. And that's the first thing. Then uh, it doesn't mean that I will use that tool directly. I will then check uh, from where the Docker container. If it is official Docker container, it's fine. If it's not official, I would prefer to make it myself. If it is from a bio containers, that's also good. Sometimes I remember they had, uh, at least for some of the tools, they had some problems with versioning. It looked like either it was updated or I couldn't find, or, or maybe it was like the latest version all the time. I don't remember, but I remember that I had some kind of not very good experience with bio containers for some of the tools. Uh, and then, I don't know, maybe it's only me, but sometimes I feel like I prefer to spend more time to write my own Docker file to see what is inside the Docker container and then run it. Unless I can see the Docker file attached to the Docker image on Docker Hub, for example. Because otherwise there are a lot of kind of tiny configuration that you can put inside a Docker uh, container and then Docker image, and then it will not work as expected, at least from my experience. And uh, the workflows, 
I would say I don't even try to Google them because usually uh, they kind of vary from task to task. So the most important for me is to find the tools which works. Um, and some of them or a lot of them are on this uh, by CWL tools repository, if I remember the name correct. And I also try That's to right, contribute yeah. to that repository yeah. as well. At least those tools that I'm confident in. Same here too. I tend to go back to bio CWL tools first. If I find a tool there, I try using it. We have a strict format with how we want our tools to be written in terms of documentation and um, quoting out the inputs and outputs and the format too. So we then take the definition and format it in the way we would like it to be. Uh, if it's not there, I tend to write our own CWL tools. Again, like Michael, if I have time, I would really like, I have tried to contribute it back to the bio CWL tools. Uh, workflows is independent. That depends on how we want to tune in the tool, right? It depends on which parameters do I want to switch on based on the inputs. The workflows are mostly our own tool. So that's how we are finding the tools. And also the tests. Tests are really useful in the CWL tool repo itself, the common workflow language, the tests that are written, you know, the smaller ones. Sometimes these are nice to look at if you want to see how a particular feature has to be used. So we found those useful too. One more thing to mention, at least based on my experience, sometimes the program that you try to, to, to wrap inside the CWL format, they're not well uh, adapted to be, to be used inside CWL. What I mean, for example, some programs expect to have a special files downloaded into the special location. And then mm. I had to even kind of create some patch for the workflow, uh, not, for the, not for the workflow, for the tool, or even inside the, the Docker file, when I create the Docker file to change or maybe to pre-download some data, uh, because it's not good if the Docker container every time when I run it tries to download something and, and it happens sometimes. Another problem, or um, maybe it's not a problem, it's more like a, a solution for that, pro for that problem is to, uh, to use that um, function in, functionality in CWL format to stage some files into the specific location. Because uh, if I remember correct, for example, some programs uh, want to create some temporary data alongside the input file. And the input file usually is read-only mounted. So the program fails without no reasons, because when you run it manually, not inside CWL file, it works fine. As soon as you put it inside CWL file, inside Docker container, and then inside CWL file, it fails because somehow that program tries to create some temporary data. So that's why staging into the working directory helps a lot in, in these situations. The problem is that it's difficult sometimes to track the real problem, what is happening and, and why it actually happens like that. So Michael, can't you use the initial workday requirement to stage the specific files in the location you would like those to be, like the workday mostly? Sometimes, sometimes I need to even rename the files. Uh, the latest example, when we want to use Cell Ranger to map uh, single cell data, mm -hmm. uh, the program expects to have a certain names uh, for the fast queue files. But the user in our system is not required to provide the files with these names. So I have to stage them into the uh, working directory with the proper names, um, and then Cell Ranger works with them. Otherwise, it just yeah. cannot find them. So, and these yeah. limitations happens very often because people who develop the program, they probably don't expect, or maybe, I don't know why, but maybe they don't expect that people will try to use it in a, some- Decorative environment, I think. Yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, another example, for example, oh, uh, for um, fast key dump, the program that downloads data from SRA mm -hmm. toolkit. Uh, 
sometimes it tries to create some uh, to to cache some data. So it also makes some problem. I don't remember the exact situation, but either it didn't work without internet connection at all. Let's say I want to run the the Docker uh, the CWL file with the Docker, and it doesn't work without internet connection because it always tried to download something. Or it was really similar to this situation. So a lot of the problems comes from the tools uh, that we tried to put inside CWL format. Yes, please, Tomaya. Yeah, uh, yeah, I had uh, uh, Hirotaka Suetake, uh, who is a developer of Sapporo, is currently working on the system to wrap uh, GitHub re repository as the uh, task uh, that is uh, to re registry service. And also, uh, he, he tried to uh, uh, implement uh, that system with uh, some testing framework that keeps uh, uh, that uh, to make uh, uh, to redefinition keep working. Uh, it is just uh, for your information. Yeah, something that I wanted is to have some either a more centralized location of, of CWL wrappers, although um, I guess as my, Michael said, sometimes they're not, uh, the, sometimes the wrappers other people have written don't actually work for, for your, your case, but it's to, to try to have something, you know, sort of like PyPy, where it's like just the one place that you go and, and search for these things, or or at least some kind of like index where you could keep all of the various tools to try to make this really easy. Um, so actually something that can uh, use, I guess, the tool, reg the GA4GH tool registry service on top of GitHub repositories could be very useful because I, I think maybe today things are so spread out that a an index that that goes out and finds uh, GitHub repositories um, like some something that's actually going out and searching for things and generate creating an index that way creating a search engine <clears throat> might be a better solution than trying to get people to put things in a centralized repository. Anyway, that's a, yeah. a project if anyone's yeah. looking for one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's similar to how Jenkins manages the plugins, but they fork the repositories under a central organization. Maybe we could do something similar, or I think Alex also has a central reg registry of tools that you can use. It would be useful to have a central repository. Maybe forking repositories under organization would work, I think. Right. And I think we are yeah. almost so <laughs> I was gonna say the same thing. I think we're we've reached the yeah. end of this session. Uh last last thoughts. Oh, nothing from me. Thanks for arranging Peter, Michael, and team as usual. Uh, the conference, the sessions are great. I need to follow up on a couple of talks. But yeah, it was great. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>